And actually, I would like uh, to thank you one more time uh, to be with us in this online version of our Just Europe conference. So welcome. And uh, thank actually, you. I have to ask you first, what is going on in Hungary nowadays? Uh, I would like to actually start with this COVID crisis uh, and the question how the virus has influenced uh, the democracy and rule of law across Europe. So if you can give us something from first hand. Well, this is obviously as everywhere a time where everybody is worried. Um, in Hungary, thankfully, the numbers of people infected and, and the fatalities are not high. There is very little testing though, so I think a lot of people are probably rightfully thinking that there's a lot more people who are infected. And so there's a high sense of risk. The, the measures that the government has taken so far in that affect you know, your daily life, are not complete uh, lockdowns, but rather restrictions. But um, here in Budapest, life is, I must say, very, very slow. So walking around downtown where I live means that it's basically a, you know, a shell, an empty, uh, an empty place. And that also conveys this message, I think, that people are really, they don't know what's going to happen. And when it comes to, to um, not the medical issues directly, but rather the, the political issues, I think there's also a sense of, of heightened uncertainty. As every government, the Hungarian government had to take a lot of measures and emergency measures. And here there was, um, as I, I think a lot of people have heard on 30th of March, an emergency authorization law was adopted by the Hungarian parliament because the government was seeking very wide range of powers to enable it to take action. Um, in terms of the scope and in terms of the time, the, the law does not have very clear limits. So it enables the government really to do a lot, a lot more than what could necessarily be um, you know, justified to, to respond to the crisis and to manage its impact. This is the gravest worry that, um, that this um, extremely wide powers that the government has now um, obtained from parliament to rule by decree, to set aside laws, to change laws, will result in a situation that can go on for as, basically as long as the government wants to. Mm -hmm. without any periodic renewal by the parliament, without strong parliamentary oversight, and that this power can be used to change a lot of issues and topics that are not related to this COVID crisis. Um, since the, the law came into force last week, the government has already adopted a range of, of um, decrees. Some of these are clearly um, ones where uh, the political opponents, the opposition political parties are put at a, a strong disadvantage. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the measures which I think is really um, uh, one of the first measures is of course to set up a, an emergency recovery fund to identify budgetary resources that can be diverted, redirected to serve the, the crisis management one source that the, the government has uh, identified is the, the central budgetary support for political parties. And this is going to be already, it's cut by 50%. Okay. This affects opposition parties far more because in practice, Fidesz, the ruling party and the Hungarian government have very blurry lines between their own resources. We've seen this in political campaigns, for example, where it was impossible to distinguish when is it that Fidesz is talking and when is the Hungarian government talking? So Fidesz has a, a, a far more almost unlimited resources at its disposal. The political opposition does not. Another similar um, worrying measure was that the revenues of local municipalities, um, certain tax revenues, is going to be now diverted to the central budget. Okay. And this affects all municipalities, but it particularly disadvantages those where there is an opposition mayor, 
where gains, the opposition political parties made gains uh, last October when there were municipal elections in Hungary. So when mayors and local municipal authorities have a, a lot to do, but have very scarce resources already, and these are being decreased, of course, this will be uh, potentially very detrimental for political support for the opposition. At the same time, the government is, of course, always at an advantage in, in a crisis. And it seems that, um, that uh, Orban is using this opportunity in many ways to not deal with the crisis directly per se, but to also, on the side, make it a far more dif difficult for political opponents, for dissenters. And so this is, I think, the big uncertainty, how the Hungarian government will want to use these powers um, that can go on for, for very, very long, for indefinitely. And this uncertainty can lead to absolute government overreach without a strong support system for the rule of law checks and balances. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for this update. I mean, I have to say to some extent it's not surprising because we knew even before that has, there has been some serious problem with the rule of law in Hungary. So it was kind of the expected, you know, that in a moment of crisis, the leaders who are in favor of breaking the rule of law can use this opportunity, you know, to grab more power and to reduce the rights. So I would like to go a little bit back to the past before the COVID crisis. And the situation that you've been dealing also as a human rights activist uh, within EU, there has been several attempts of the parliament, even the council has started to do something with, um, with the problems of rule of law in Hungary and later in Poland. Uh, can you estimate how satisfied were you with those attempts? And second, my second question is, are you following the new measures the commission is now implementing, like this new questionnaire, there will be a report. Is this working mm -hmm. or not? Yeah, the uh, Hungary, of course, has been on the on the agenda, on the radar for many years, and we've seen how in the past few years the European Commission, particularly, has um, been uh, paying far more attention and taking a lot more action than previously. We saw this in a number of value-based infringement measures that have been started and are now uh, hopefully going to be reaching a phase where the European Court of Justice will be delivering opinions. Um, on the Central European University case, for example, or in the 2017 foreign-funded NGO law, we hope that uh, this year we will finally see judgments from the court. And also, of course, the European Parliament has been extremely active and it triggered the Article 7 procedure uh, about Hungary, which um, is now at the, at the council, at the minister's, Member states have uh, have now the you know the the primary role. Um, I can't say that we're very satisfied with how the General Affairs Council has been proceeding on this. I think it would be extremely important to to once this um, once this process has started to take it very seriously and to use it as an opportunity for not only dialogue but also for making recommendations for the Hungarian government. Now, the last, um, the second um, uh, hearing on Hungary in the General Affairs Council was in December. Today, we're already in early April. So many things have happened. And it would be, I think, really important now to have the General Affairs Council put Hungary on the agenda again and to discuss what are the measures that could be recommended um, to the Hungarian government. So not only have a, have a, a very open-ended and uh, you know, not very impactful dialogue, but rather to say, we're very concerned about the overreach potential of these emergency laws. We think that would be my recommendation that a sunset clause is really necessary. So I think this, these are the, 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 the um, sort of immediate actions, um, but also, the long-term uh, or general impact on the European Union's infrastructure, the rule of law and, and, and value infrastructure um, is really important. And this is, I think, why the European Commission's rule of law monitoring report, this new cycle, is important. It would be great if it was not um, a very technical exercise, but something 
where the information that is collected and, and uh, summarized by the commission would be taken up by other actors too. So it shouldn't be a report, you know, that it just rests then on a, on a desktop, but it should be a, um, a living report in this sense where the, um, the, the concerns that are not only in Hungary and Poland, but in many other member states, sadly, would be taken forward. And this is something that also the council could discuss and national parliaments too. Civil society has an extremely important role in this to contribute. I think there is a, there, this is the first year, so you can't get everything right initially, but I think it would be really important for a lot of civil society organizations to contribute. And this is a challenge now, particularly now amid this COVID crisis, a lot of attention is diverted, even for the human rights NGOs, which are, um, have a vested interest in contributing to this process. But I think, you know, as a sort of a, not only to address recommendations to institutions, but also to civil society organizations, I think it would be really great if a lot of organizations from every member state would contribute. The questionnaire is very wide ranging. So I think um, even if, if, if it's not a, an organization with a sort of a general overview, but with one specific or, or a couple of specific issues, they would find the space to, to, to include that without having good information from the ground, solid, reliable, um, that it will, this whole monitoring cycle will be weaker. So I think we also as civil society have to make sure that this is, this important instrument is used to its full potential um, as soon as possible. Mm. Thank you for that. And I mean, definitely we will uh, send again a message to Croatian government, maybe to really to put on General Affairs Council finally the hearing of continuation of hearings, because we are not happy how the actual Croatian government, which is presiding the council, is totally ignoring the rule of law uh, issue, probably because at home, back at home, we also have some of the problems um, in that uh, area, but we are keep on working uh, on that. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to uh, when we are talking about the European, um, you know, opportunities on EU level, what can be done? I always remember two things uh, done by the, some of the members of Hungarian government. When there was the G General Affairs Council hearing, your Minister of Foreign Affairs was actually making fun out of it. He was tweeting and sending, the, leaking the messages from this hearing, blaming Soros again and again. So making actually the hearing ridiculous and Second thing which happened a few days ago, probably you noticed that the Western governments issued this uh, statement how rule of law is important in a time of the crisis. And I think it, takes two, it took two days later that even the Hungarian government signed the letter and said, yes, of course, this is a very important letter. So uh, I'm afraid, you know, that the expectations that EU institutions can deal with the situation in one country are maybe limited. So maybe should we focus more to see what can be done with the Hungarian people uh, and, you know, how to help you to work grassroots on the change? Or do you think there is a needed balance from both? Yeah, certainly when the December GAC hearing um, was uh, live tweeted by the Hungarian government spokesperson, um, that was, um, many people said, the ultimate trolling. I think it was meant to divert attention from what is being talked about. Um, the same with the statement that eventually 16 member states signed, also Slovakia and the Baltic states, which until now have not been, you know, putting themselves so much um, out there on, on, uh, on these issues, um, at least publicly. Um, the, that statement failed to specifically name Hungary, although it was very clear that, the, that it was about Hungary, but it was a big missed opportunity not to talk about Hungary. Um, you have to call a spade a spade, I think. It's, 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 it's not the time to be you know, overly cautious because, because this also provided then an opportunity for the Hungarian government to actually troll this statement and sign on to it. Wouldn't it be great if the Hungarian government would also, you know, and beyond the trolling opportunities, would genuinely um, show genuine consideration and respect for the rule of law? But yes, of course, you know, these even if if they're perfectly um, managed and and worded, these uh, European Union actions will never be. Uh, 
effective unless people in Hungary also show that they care about not having arbitrary government overreach, that they want to make sure that everybody's rights are protected, that they want to hold government accountable. And at this time, um, I think, as with many other issues, this crisis is also showing how fragile our liberties are. Um, there was 100,000 people who signed an online petition against this authorization act. Mm -hmm. Over a, a span of, of a week, a lot of people mobilized. That's for, for a Hungarian um, audience, I think it's a very significant number. But uh, when an online um, demonstration was organized, of course, uh, as a follow-up to this action, right the, the evening before the adoption of the law by parliament, of course, this will never be as visible as a real life protest. So we, I think, have to be extremely um, creative about how in this, the confines of the digital space, right? Yeah. Um, how we can ex actually express uh, political views and in a way that is, uh, that is, that is not um, uh, further polarizing, but rather gets the, the real message, the real genuine concern across that can have a space for for discussion and I think this is one of the the big there's lots of limitations on 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 this digital space yeah we can't go out and and demonstrate on the street but it's also harder to find platforms and to ha find bridges to other people um, who don't share the same views and who are beyond uh, your own bubble your information bubble your digital bubble and so I think we have to find ingenious ways for this. What we have done, for example, in Hungary now is that we've joined um, together with two other human rights organizations and we had an online workshop, a public event, where people could send in questions beforehand and we answered them. And there is quite a lot of information sharing and public events, of course, being moved to the digital space. Um, Many of the other actions uh, are to give information to explain to people what are these specific emergency rules, how do they impact individuals in their daily lives, what do you know, restrictions on freedom of movement mean, what can police do, what should doctors do if they run into um, legal questions, so we're providing free legal assistance and advice to doctors and, and individuals much more broadly than, than under sort of normal times. So I think this is one way to show that, um, that the law does have meaning for everybody and legal safeguards also, and to try to make this as accessible as possible. In that way, people will, I think, I'm hoping that they will better see the, the the value of not only this service, but other services that human rights groups do for democracy and will be, and people should be able to this way connect with receiving, you know, value, something that they cannot get elsewhere now, particularly with these limitations that we have to live with. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and let's end this short uh, interview with this positive, uh, actually, view how we can use this crisis, you know, to contribute more human rights and more democracy in our countries. Thank you very much one more time. Thank you.